Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, DevOps Days LA. I am very excited to be here. I'm not excited that the Portland, Oregon rain followed me, um, but uh, happy to be with you all today. Uh, I'm gonna give my talk, Taming Feral DevOps, a little bit about me. I am a former dev who turned into a former op who is now a current marketer over at Chronosphere. You probably have not heard of us. We are an observability platform powered by OSS instrumentation. Shout out to both Prometheus and OpenTelemetry, my two loves. And I want to give a little context for this talk. Um, I'm a bit of a younger op. Uh, I like to say that I was a baby developer, born in the Docker container, auto-deployed to an EC2 instance that was configured by Ansible, managed with Terraform, and just kind of born into this world of complexity. Um, and so that is a little bit of context for the rest of the talk. And I would also like to say, in addition to Chronosphere sponsoring my time, um, shout out to Circle CI, who has let us, oh, who have let me borrow their charger. <laughs> so Circle CI sponsoring this conference, sponsoring the power for this talk. On the docket today, I will open up with a cautionary tale. I will dig into the pitfalls of what I call feral DevOps. I will give you some tactics for taming. And we will ask the eternal question, are we DevOpsing yet? So let's go. We're gonna rewind back to early 2016. Look at me, I am a baby developer. I am a, I've got my happy shining face. I do not think I have audio, but you will see the, um, you can see the captions. So basically that was uh, a video from my company and just said the year before I was in HR operations, the next year I was doing software development. How cool is it to run your own infrastructure? I was having a ball. I managed my team's Jenkins box. I set up our pipelines. I was learning all about AWS and Terraform and just like this magical process of turning code that people wrote into actual running processes that mattered and that people used um, is magic. And I wondered, looking around at my ops friends who were older and who were leads and who had long tenured seasoned careers, I said, I'm so happy. Why are all my ops friends so grumpy these days? I, I just don't get it. Note, I d was not on call at the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> year one, by year three, I started to understand. If you can't read this sign, uh, it is a sign I very much agree with. Uh, it says, hi, my name's Paige. I'm the store cat. I scratch, I bite. Uh, please don't touch me or annoy me or call me fat or ask if I'm pregnant. And uh, no tickets. Uh, <laughs> ticket queue is closed. Three short years. <laughs> baby face engineer to sorely grumpy cat. And what happened? A little bit was I moved from being a software engineer where I had a lot of support from the organization over to being an SRE at startups. This meant I was working on very small teams with very outsized missions and ended up doing a little bit of everything. Part-time IT, playing a security engineer on TV, customer enablement, and then maybe if I was lucky, a little bit of the SRE work I wanted to do to improve our resiliency. A Few years later, by year six, I was burned out beyond belief, burnt to a little crisp, and ended up announcing my retirement from the field entirely. Uh, during a mental health break slash sabbatical last year, I ended up having a lot of free time to just bop around and catch up with old friends and ended up discovering not one, not two, but three of my ops friends were also on their own burnout sabbaticals at the same time, all unbeknownst to each other. And I got to thinking, dang, I am pretty sure knowledge workers are supposed to have a little bit of a longer career than just a few years. This doesn't really seem sustainable what we're doing, and this is not the dream of DevOps that I have been told. We're not doing major league sports, we're not deep sea fishing, what is going on with our field? And it really reminded me of something a colleague said when he joined my team. Uh, he said, it's so nice to be on a team again. 
it feels like I've been practicing feral DevOps. And I thought, whoa, say that again. What, what is that feral DevOps? Um, it really resonated with me. And he explains that previously at his company, he was the only DevOps engineer, the only one managing everything, making decisions, didn't have a manager, no support from the rest of the product org. Um, and he was just overjoyed to have camaraderie again. And I thought, okay, there, there's something here with this feral DevOps. I, I feel like I've been doing feral DevOps. And to me, it really encapsulates the oxymoron that a lot of companies, the state that companies find themselves in today. It reflects kind of the abandonment that my colleague Keith and I had both felt from previous orgs and teams we had been on, um, from organizations that don't invest the same amount um, into their operations and sustainable maintenance as they do into development and developers. I identified with Feral being in survival mode being buried in toil in Slack, Slack help desk tickets. We can talk about Slack help desk all day. Um, and please just use a knowledge base, Stack Overflow for Teams, Confluence, I don't care what it is, but please get your knowledge out of Slack. Um, and so over, this, over that year, I had time to hire and backfill my SRE team. Was not a manager, I was interim managing. And I noticed, as other folks came in, they also had to unlearn some of these survival habits that they had picked up from being the only DevOps or the only SRE. And so we could debate till the end of time what DevOps actually means, what is real DevOps, but I would like to just define it by what it's not. Um, and I personally love Chris's take on this. The most wrong definition one could probably give is that DevOps is a buzzword. Um, Chris and I are in total agreement. To me, DevOps is about people first, empathy, communication, collaboration. Then it comes into processes. How do these teams work together? And finally, it's about delivering on a shared goal and having like mutual success. And I really try to not be that guy or that grumpy cat when it comes to defining DevOps, but I have the microphone, so you will have to indulge a very small soapbox. Another anti-definition for me is DevOps as a title, a department, a function within a company, because when I hear DevOps team, DevOps engineer, DevOps, DevOps director in mind, I hear collaboration engineer. That's the teamwork team. Oh, that's the cross-functional director of communications. Like, it sounds so silly, um, because isn't it all of our jobs, no matter your role or function, to talk to each other, gather requirements and understand? We're all a part of the hashtag same team. And very small side note, when I was interviewing for dev roles last year before I retired, I would ask these directors, hey, I see this open role for a DevOps engineer. What's that about? Tell me how you got to that title. Tell me about your philosophy. And like four out of five of them would say, oh my gosh, I know. I know, trust me, I know what DevOps really is. We just have to have that title because it gets the job applicants in. And uh, it was sort of a litmus test to see how well aligned my philosophies were with the companies. So let's get into a little bit of the signs of feral DevOps. This cat and I have a lot in common. We've got too much responsibility. Working on an under-resourced team, being responsible for the path from PR to production, managing every single environment along the way, expected to troubleshoot north-south, east-west, applications you didn't even know were running that someone deployed while you weren't looking. It's a lot. And in the current environment with the pandemic and everything going on around the globe, we just don't have that cognitive capacity anymore to spare. It's important to draw those boundaries and those lines. Another aspect that I find very fascinating is uh, recently we've started to discover that executives do not understand the experience of those of us on the ground carrying the pager. And um, I believe it is catch point so lovingly called it executive optimism bias, that 
our executives and our directors, they have, they've been sold on the vision. They're sold on continuous delivery. They want to innovate faster. They want to have good, great teamwork. But they're just out of touch with the actual experience of spinning the plates, keeping the system alive, and putting out fires. Um, so it kind of is like they approach it. I'll do the DevOps. We'll fix the things. Teams are going good. So that's another pitfall of feral DevOps that we're finding now. Sure, you have a DevOps team, but are you practicing DevOps? Does it feel like your teams are collaborating together? Something else this leads to is the fear of experimentation. I don't know if any of you have worked with somebody like this, but I used to work with quite a few folks who were pretty burned out and pretty stressed from fighting fires all the time. And anytime someone came with a new idea or, oh my gosh, let's do ephemeral PRs environments or any sort of thing that got developers excited, we had a couple people that would just say, no, <laughs> like we're not doing that, that's a bad idea and wouldn't entertain the conversation. And I get it, when you're responsible for everything and the buck stops with you, which it ultimately does with operations and infrastructure, uh, I would rather upgrade our clusters. I would rather get us on a, on a better maintenance schedule um, than chase the new shiny things. But this is one of the things that leads to that gulf. Um, you become the person that says no, you become the gatekeeper. Um, and so that just also contributes to the siloization. Oh my gosh, okay. This is also one of my favorite ones, is when folks use opinions over data. Um, and the more time you spend at a company, the more that you understand how the technical aspects work, you may understand the, so the social aspects of departments and um, which teams are a little touchy, which teams you know, are really good with their monitoring. Um, and that leads us to make some assumptions. And something I hear a lot is, devs just don't care about X, monitoring alert hygiene, observability, those are the things I think about. But fill in the blank with what you want, testing, security, docs, and it's those two words, don't care, that really stand out to me because when you talk to developers, when you do you know, the first part of DevOps, like talking, um, you find out it's not that they don't care. They're under different demands and pressures, we kind of shoved Kubernetes at them and said, hey, yeah, it's great, um, without actually bringing them along on the learning journey. So something to be mindful of is if you feel the inclination to say that another group that you're not a part of doesn't care, stop to ask yourself if you've even had the conversation with them. And very occasionally, you will run into a developer that does say, oh no, I don't care about ops. And in that case, like, you do you. But on the whole, let's approach it with a more open mind. Sort of on this level is patronizing the developers. Um, and I'm speaking mostly because I've been on uh, ops in SRE teams. It's not that, there's, there's no one that's better than the other, but, I, but things that I hear are like, oh, devs can't see past their IDE. Oh, they just don't know what it's like. We have to take all the labor on in ops. And I think, well, I don't know, some of you uh, can't see past your terminal. Some of you have got to update your processes and use the beautiful new tools like tracing um, that have come into existence. So we're all on a learning journey together, and it's important to remember that. So a little bit of a story time before we get into some tactics and breaking down the taming of the feral DevOps. There's one company I worked for that had a multi-year migration. They were getting out of Rancher, something was being EOL'd there, and they moved to Kubernetes. Ops team was stoked. We were getting a lot of great benefits, good maintenance, um, more active ecosystem, and we completed the migration and immediately launched into migrating all of their CI CD from one vendor to another. And that meant we were kind of stressed because when you move vendors, most of the time it's due to wanting to get out of a contract and you've got an arbitrary deadline like when the contract expires, that's totally not based on the actual project work it would take to move from A to B. And so we were 
tired. We had just done a multi-year migration to Kubernetes. We didn't have time to educate the developers, so we were getting a ton of low-level, very valid, but very easy to troubleshoot questions like, what is image poll error? Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> but when I put on my empathy hat, I said, well, we came from Rancher, and these devs were using Docker Compose locally. It was very easy to turn it into a Rancher Compose. They spoke the language. They had been operating the system just fine for the past few years. We threw them into the deep end, not only shoving so much YAML at them, but also, hey, here's Go templating with Helm. Hey, here's Argo CD. Do you know what an app of apps is? Oh my gosh. So I started to realize while I got frustrated with all of these really basic questions that kept coming over and over, we hadn't done our job to be a good partner to them. And it was a little bit stressful. Um, so from the point of the view of the developers, they looked at Kubernetes like this. This is my cat, Norman. They were like, what is this? What is a pod? What is crash loop back off? Um, we moved their cheese. And then we had the gall to move their pipelines, the things that they had depended on to deliver their code safely to prod. And yes, it was technically a lift and shift, but every vendor has their own flavor and weird things that they call their features. And so it was just a lot of cognitive overhead that fell to ops because we were the ones that knew Kubernetes. We were the ones that knew Docker and all of the Argo CD and everything that we had stitched together that was great from our point of view. Um, but it kind of felt like we were out in the cold. Like we had taken on an outsized responsibility compared to the devs. And it did not feel like DevOps. It felt like, didn't even feel like ops dev. It just felt like ops in the old days from what I hear. And so that's what it was like as a, I see. When I thought, I'll put my CTO hat on, I thought, what is the impact to the business and to leaders? And what that meant really from their perspective was we couldn't ship features quick enough. It meant that it was really hard to debug and troubleshoot because there was so, only so many ops compared to lots of devs who needed help and attention. And it meant that our incidents took longer, took longer to troubleshoot, and eventually we became stressed, burned out, overworked, tired, and demotivated. My entire team, save for an architect, actually ended up quitting within six weeks of me joining. My manager quit, and my recruiter quit in a very weird <laughs> series of events. So while it was individually not great for the devs, it was individually not great for the ops. Zooming out at the macro level wasn't good for the business either. We had a DevOps team, but we weren't doing DevOps. We weren't getting any of the benefits of it. So now we can get into the taming of the feral DevOps. I think from some of those examples you may have, that may resonate with you with experiences that you've had on the job. So what do we do about it? Um, and I thought, oh, I think ops people are kind of like cats. Um, maybe I could just look up how you tame a feral cat, and maybe that'd be the same thing as taming a feral dev op. Let's see. And I found a few things in common. First of all, learning how to assess the opportunity. Because not all dev ops are the same, same with feral cats. Some are totally feral. They've just been in environments that did not support them for so long, they just don't even trust that organizations will be there to support them. You could have a semi-feral cat who's maybe had some positive experiences, maybe someone gives them a little kibble, but they're skeptical, they keep their distance, they might be rehabable. And finally, you have a young junior, a junior dev up, a converted feral, someone who had a house, who had a nice team, maybe they even had a project manager for DevOps, oh my god, and somehow they got abandoned and lost on their way. So you gotta figure out, what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with a seasoned operator who has lived through how many reorgs and how many big hype cycles? Are we dealing with someone who's just seen a little bit, but they're really tired and the next job could be their make or break? Or are we dealing with the next generation of operators who we have a responsibility to to make their experience better than the ones that we've had. 
And the longer that you live within this feral system, the more you learn to look out for yourself to survive, to put up those walls and that silo. So something to be aware of. When approaching a feral DevOps or a feral cat, observe the energy. It's not always time to announce your great idea for the rewrite, or hey, I'd like to upgrade all of our Terraform and it's breaking change. Read the room. Um, figure out when a good time is to initiate feedback and initiate change. While we, hopefully, do not bite, hiss, or scratch, um, we do gatekeep. Sometimes we use sarcasm, and sometimes we just say no to any developer requests. Another important thing is to look at yourself and your organization. Is, do you have the ability, do you have the will to change and to pursue this DevOps transformation? Do you have the time, energy, and resources? Or is that something for next year? And note that what works for some companies won't work for yours. It's all about your people, your tech, your tools. And apparently, on the cat time scale, uh, a small kitten can be tamed in two to six weeks, while an adult feral takes a year. So somebody run the stats on that for your junior dev op and your seasoned op and report back. And another thing we've got in common is you've got to build trust. Um, the longer that you stay at an ineffective org, watching initiatives fall over, watching leadership turnover and att attrition and people with really great new strategies that don't end up making it the course. You want to be consistent. If you're going to decide to take the DevOps journey and you're going to decide that it's right for your org, you've got to commit and you've got to prove to some of your skeptics, some of your seasoned feral cats, that you really mean it. And that means consistency over time making these investments. For cats, it means feeding them at the same time, same place, and for people, it's follow through and demonstrating that you do have the will to change, and you know that it will be a long, hard road. And finally, when you bring a feral cat into the house, you gotta get them set up. You, you need to give them a small little room. Everything they need needs to be in one pause, reach away, and the same thing when you're rehabbing a feral DevOps. You wanna get your documentation in order, you want to think about how to disambiguate this is the tech stack we use and this is the way that we, <clears throat> I won't say bastardize, but this is the creative way that we have found to apply that technology within our org. Separating those two is really key. Not everybody uses Helm the same way, as I found out. And so, kind of to bring it all together, the signs of feral DevOps that you may recognize within yourself or within your organization are permanent on call, uh, specifically for internal tools, specifically for CICD. I do not know why I don't see internal status pages for the same things that we, you know, if you have a production outage that makes the status page, why not do the same thing internally when your build system's down? Um, also, just to help people set that boundary between uh, I cannot be on call for something 24-7, 365. That's just not the job any of us signed up for. You might notice charged incident reviews. Um, I do not use the term, term post-mortem. I like to use incident reviews. You may notice that people get defensive. They cross their arms. They play the blame game. They have the meeting before the meeting. Um, incident reviews are a time that really expose the, the seams of the org. And then the longer this goes on, it turns into apathy, where you have people that say, fine, whatever, install Vault, I don't care. <laughs> or they say, eh, yeah, you do your thing, whatever, I'll run it. Um, and they're not using their, their smarts and the skills that brought them into the job. They're just kind of letting whatever happen to the environment. And in very serious cases, that turns into burnout and attrition. You're just totally losing folks. So, the big question is, are we DevOpsing yet? I like to think that I was raised right by the Portland DevOps community, my local DevOps days of Portland, where I learned it's about empathy, collaboration, and sharing your success. So the first thing you'll wanna do is just look in the mirror. How might you be contributing to a feral DevOps environment? 
what part of your approach could benefit from the change? Talk to your skeptics. Every org's got a few of these. <laughs> the grumpy folks who just are, are, want you to prove it, um, they want you to walk the walk, not talk the talk. Document, document, document. How can I RTFM if you did not WTFM is the question I pose. Um, and just three reasons to write docs, because this is also my soapbox. Great source for training. You can bring on new folks and show them documentation to get them started. You can scale your collaboration. The more SRE teams you have, you've already got a template going. Um, and troubleshooting and handoffs. So many times do I hear about services, service ownership getting passed from team to team without even a meeting, without even going over the dashboards. It is nuts out there what people are doing with microservices. So what we really want to do, if you want to tame feral DevOps, I broke it into three phases. Communicate between the execs and the engineers, bridge that, bridge that uh, optimism bias, pop that bubble for them. Then between DevOps and devs, next step, you want to learn. Share the expertise across team boundaries and across silos. And make your on-call better. Oh my gosh. Um, that is the lorem ipsum, but it is good to know about Mercury. <laughs> Communicate. I want to give you some tactics that you can take away today um, to put into practice. If your org is super feral, you're going to want to do that in one-on-ones. You're going to want to get the feelings and people expressing themselves in a private environment. Something one of my companies did was a lost productivity survey. And we said, hey, developers, anytime you feel frustrated or you felt like you just did a total waste of time, fill out this one question survey. Tell us what it was. We won't promise that we'll fix it, but it's on our radar. Or go to a neutral zone, like a community practice or a SIG, um, like a reliability community of practice, where it's not any one team's turf, but it's time to talk about topics together. How do you learn together? Second part, game days, love a game day. Even tabletop disaster recovery exercises, I was very skeptical, but they've turned out to be a really valuable source of uncovering how different people approach different incidents. Um, one of my favorite new games comes from Noble Nine, which is paged at 3 a.m., where they give you a series of scenarios, and they say, would you act the page, would you ignore the page, um, or would you do something else? And my favorite is, if the CEO pages you at 3 a.m., says the site isn't loading for them, what do you do? We can talk about your answer later. Uh, it could be as simple as setting up one hour a week for study time or running a lunch conf where you all just dial into a Zoom. You watch one conference talk together from maybe scale. Um, and then you talk about it after. You have a shared experience. And sometimes you can make more headway when your thoughts and philosophies just come out of someone else's mouth. Um, and then you can say, wow. Wasn't that a great idea about CICD? We should totally try that, as if I haven't been telling you for the last six months. Um, and again, please write the docs. And finally, sustainable operations now. Uh, I remember my first monotrauma where I heard Bridget Cromout talk about the pain of operations and how it had affected her, and I thought, how the heck did I have to retire because I was so burned out and we still haven't fixed this problem? So for me, sustainable operations is the best place to start. Audit your alerts, every single one of them, every single one that can page a person and wake them up at 3 a.m. Figure out if it's actionable, if you need it, if it's cruft. Um, it is grungy work, but so valuable. Refactor your on-call rotations just like you refactor your architecture. Please don't have sprint points on call. That's your time to make the system better. Do gardening tasks. And finally, start to introduce learning reviews instead of postmortems. So in conclusion, there's really two questions that you've just got to ask yourself. You could, you could forget everything I just said and just ask yourself these two things. What does ops need to understand about dev? And what does dev need to understand about ops? That's your starting place. 
so that we can become a glorious team together. Thank you.